Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, first things first, I'd love if you could introduce yourself to the audience and uh, tell us what you're about. Uh, thank you, Jason. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm really excited that you're launching a podcast because of where I know it's going to take you. So uh, an honor to be one of the first guests. And uh, you know, the, the who I am in the backstory is I'm a recovering college professor. I think you know that. And- <laughs> that really means is I'm just not wired to live in a bureaucracy for, so a bureaucracy for the long term. Apparently, I'm not wired to say the word bureaucracy today either. <laughs> and uh, I, I sort of did that job for a decade, had a great run, built a couple of nationally recognized programs at two different universities. But, you know, one of the things that's true in that world, like in many others, is the better you are at what you do best, the less of it you get to do. Because you move up the chain and you start doing more, you know, leadership and management and stuff. And I reached this point where I just was really missing the the impact I felt I was having. So I left that world and went into full-time speaking, coaching, and consulting. So I had started my consulting practice the same day I was hired at the University of Illinois. And I was now, I'm now 35 years into that. Um, so for the last 35 years, I've done full-time or part-time for the first 10, full-time for the last 25, speaking, coaching, and consulting. And uh, today I work with people like you, people who have a a gift and a message that they're seeking to use to help others and impact the world and create movements with, and I help them discover and unlock that message. That's great, Michael. Thank you. Uh, We'll be hearing a lot more about that throughout our time together today. One of the things I like to do with some of my guests is uh, talk a little bit about how we know each other, like how we met, and then also what are our first impressions of each other? So I guess I'll share how you and I met, and then we can trade off first impressions. I think you've given me the information about me. I don't know that I've ever given you the information about you. So this should be a fun little exercise for you. Find out something. Absolutely. So, yeah. So we met through heroic public speaking, which is uh, what I believe to be the best public speaking program on the planet. Uh, you can express your opinion on that a little bit later. And I think I probably know your opinion already. Yeah, well, and um, yeah, so we, we were in a cohort of, I believe uh, about 55 people. Uh, I was one of the people in the room who is not a professional speaker. And so uh, I guess I'll start with my impression of you. Uh, I believe when I was introduced to you, you were introduced to me as a, a coach and a professional speaker. You've been speaking for, like you said, for decades, and I'm going to hear more about that today. So my first impression of you was that this is a, a sharp dressed guy. He's got it together. He's out doing the public professional speaking work, and he's here to hone in on a craft that he's already, you know, like, if he hasn't mastered, he's probably darn close. He's got, you know, thousands of hours on the stage and all those things. So uh, there, for me, there was a bit of comparison between myself and you because I came in at kind of the opposite side, came into that program, never delivering a speech for money in my life, uh, working in, the cor- in corporate America, doing a lot of speaking, but, you know, on behalf of other companies. So I was there to learn to enhance the skill. And quite honestly, that's all I knew I wanted out of it. And I think my impression of you is that Here's a guy who knows why he's here and knows what he's doing. And I believe at the time you were also a fellow, which means it was your tech second time through the program. So you were an old hat within pro public speaking. So I know I haven't shared that with you before, but that was my first impression of you. How about, uh, what, what did you think of me? I like that, by the way. Thank you. Um, mm-hmm. You're welcome. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? Because, you know, you're in, the, as you said, I'd been through the program before. So sitting in, in a different perspective in the program, you're, you're looking at people differently and you're wondering, you know, not in a comparison way, but in a who's got what potential, because that's kind of, you know, our role in the way we, the way, the, the role that we play as fellows in the program is looking out for the really superstars and, you know, how can we help them as well as how can we help the ones that aren't, you know, that need more help. Um, but, you know, my impression of you, and I, I've shared this with you, is you were incredibly intense. And <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I love intensity because I know how valuable it is and the passion is there, but I couldn't figure out the doorway in. And, you know, when I see that when I, and I can't do that, I sort of have these three things go through my head. You know, one, is this a person who is so confident they don't need any help and the best thing to do is let them have their birth as they walk past. And if they want help, they'll let you know. Or are they at the other side where they really would like help, but they don't know how to ask and their success in other areas of life makes it hard for them to ask? Or are they somewhere in the middle? And I really didn't have a judgment of that because, frankly, my first exposure to you was, you know, I had that little breakfast club that we met at Starbucks every morning. Mm -hmm. And and you and your roommate would pop in, grab your coffee, stick your head in, say hello, and then disappear in less than a minute or two and get on your walk to get to the 
to the facility. So yeah. we had a chance to connect. And then, you know, we finally started to connect in various ways. And I think it was probably almost the last session before we really had a good conversation. I realized, no, this guy's in that first category. He's, he's got talent. He's here to absorb and learn and see where he's going. And he's been doing that because of the things I picked up. So I, uh, that's how yeah. I walked away, and, uh, you know, Im impressed the entire time. But uh, I'm the guy who will sort of lay back and wait and let people come to me. Mm -hmm. I've found that to be something that works for me, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that that's great. Thanks for sharing that. It's um, so you're not the first person that told me that I'm that I'm intense, and I think I shared this with you when you first shared this with me. I totally get that, and I think once people get to know me, and I don't, you can say otherwise. Like most people would not describe me as somebody who's uh, afraid to ask for help, and I'm very open to help. And uh, I think what you were mentioning, the energy that you were sensing was probably my survival mechanism of being in a room of like, whoa, there's some impressive people here. And I don't consider myself one of those impressive people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't at the time, which is probably my protective mechanism that I put around myself was like, all right, let me either pretend that I'm confident, or maybe it is what you picked up is, uh, I just don't know who to ask for help. Cause it feels like nobody wants to help here. Not because they don't want to, but because I like had a story in my head about how people were um, but either way, here we are today on my podcast. So that's it. It's all good. And um, I appreciate you sharing that with me. It actually well, meant a lot to me when you shared that with me. There's, thank you. There, there's an interesting element of that, Jason, I think, you know, for your audience to think about too, no matter where you are, what you're doing, right? We all look at someone and we're going to compare them to us at various points in our life. We can't help but do that. And I have a few more years of life in than you do. And I, I looked at the intensity in you and it reminded you of me of me at that stage in my life. You know, you were very mm -hmm. successful in the career you were in. You were stepping out to explore something new. Um, my inherent curiosity made me do that a lot. And one of the things I used to be accused of was being arrogant. And, you know, as I learned over time and grew, what I began to realize is that it wasn't arrogance. It was exactly what you just described. I'm not sure who I'm comfortable asking. I don't want to make a misstep. So I'm going to observe and I'm going to just do me, which is what I think all of us need to do all the time. And doing me is I'm an intense guy. It's where I'm going, when I want to be there on time, I'm going to interact with people on the way. And when the door opens, I'm going to walk through it. And, and that's what I've learned more about you since I've gotten to know you better. Yeah, that's awesome, Michael. Well, thanks for sharing that. So uh, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to learn a lot more about you. And I've got some questions, questions that I'd like to ask you that I think our audience will find interesting. Awesome. So first question I want to ask you to kick this off is what's something that you nerd out about? Something that uh, maybe a hidden passion, hidden hobby, something that we might say, hey, that's a little bit, a little bit nerdy or maybe not, but something that really you're into that um, you'd like to share with the audience. And you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I, think, I think I do. And it's, uh, I hope for those, I, think, I hope for the people that are listening. I hope you're not hungry because I have a feeling this is what's coming. <laughs> That's where we're going. <laughs> you know, Jason, my original life vision was I'm going to get my PhD. I didn't come out of the womb wanting that. Okay, but there was a point in my life where this became my vision. Go get my PhD because when you do that, you work for four or five years, you get tenure, then you get to take a sabbatical, which is basically a year off. Mm -hmm. And my intention was get my PhD, get a job at an inst academic institution, get tenure, take a year and go to France to cooking school with a vision that I would leave academia at that time, come back and open a restaurant because I learned to cook at the apron strings of my grandmother, mm -hmm. and some of my fondest and deepest memories. Now that has evolved into an obsession with barbecue. And when I say barbecue, I'm not talking grilling. I'm talking smoking meat, brisket, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, ribs, chicken. And uh, as I, as you know, you know, I recently was uh, suckered in, not, not suckered, I, I, I was dragged without a lot of kicking and screaming. I was kind of hoping they would drag me into this barbecue competition that uh, my daughter's friends were on. And I um, had had a pretty big setup in that competition because my son-in-law had sort of told people that I was really good. Mm -hmm. um, so the pressure was on. <laughs> And I was fortunate, you know, I, I placed third overall in the competition and my chicken was third and my uh, pork was second. And uh, Amazing. So still, still ticked off my ribs, didn't place, but I think I know exactly why. And that's a whole long story we will not go into. 
But, but here's the point of why, you know, somebody says, well, why does a guy who does something like you do, who is a co- former professor and sort of still lives his life as a professor, in fact, my, my competition team is called Professor Smokes Barbecue. Um, and I am right now, Jason, you don't know this, but I am right now in talks with somebody about possibly opening a barbecue restaurant. Oh, that's amazing. I thought you were actually going to say, I don't know if you know this, but right now I'm actually smoking something in my big green egg. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, a, awesome. I'm, a, I'm a Kamado Joe fan, so big green Kamado egg. Kamado Joe. No, no. But, uh, <laughs> but, but here's the thing, right? To me, it is a metaphor for all of the work that we do. And, and no matter who you are, you know, every bit of work you do requires some vision of what you want the outcome to be and some plan and path to get there some assemblage of the necessary resources to make it happen, some level of monitoring, measuring as you go to see if you're making progress. Well, that's exactly how you smoke a brisket or a pork butt or ribs or chicken. And so that's the connection to me. But the thing is, it's different, right? I nerd out on it because it doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Now it counts if I'm competing in a competition because we all have our egos. But it is the place I can kind of disconnect I can watch YouTube videos, I can read books and learn, and then I can go play and test. And I'm not afraid to play and test because I have the confidence I can always recover it somehow at any point. Mm -hmm. I think is an important and powerful metaphor for the way we should approach our work, no matter what we do. We live in a world where testing, trying, improving, and repeating matters far more than waiting to do it right the first time. Yeah. I, I love that. That's um, something that I think we're gonna we're gonna talk more about today. Like the the crux of perfectionism, and the reality is in uh, like specifically here on cooking and smoking. What's perfect? There is no such thing as a perfect rib. It's all judgment. It's all uh, you know at the at the women mercy of the judges or at the person's taste buds. And what might be perfect for one person might not taste that good to somebody else. So yeah, I think that's a great analogy. Or um, you know some of the other things we're going to talk about today. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, cool. Quick question on the on the on the smoking. If you could only smoke one thing, like let's say that you had, let's say that you had your all time hero over, and you got to smoke one thing, what would you smoke for them? Brisket. Brisket. Brisket, because I can do a killer brisket, and I have a bourbon barbecue sauce that you will adore. Even though good brisket doesn't necessarily need sauce, it's nice to have that little once in a while dip it in some sauce. And, um, and that's my go-to if I, I, and in fact, I have a, a CEO of a client that, uh, that he, vac- he vacations near me and, um, he lives in Phoenix and I had them over this summer and that's what I made. And it was a fantastic meal that, uh, whether it leads to business or not, it's not the issue, but, uh, that, that's, the, <laughs> that's the meal that I know people love the most. Now, if kids are involved, we're going a different route, but that's, uh, but brisket, if it's an adult meal, yeah, so bourbon. Well, brisket and bourbon just go together. Yeah. So what you're saying is maybe sometime in the future, we may see Professor Smoke's uh, bourbon barbecue sauce on the shelves. Um, I'm working on it. I, I, and then here's the, here's the lesson to that, right? I have had to stop experimenting and start writing it down as I go so I mm-hmm. can. So, yes. And it's probably going to be, be Professor Smoke's bourbon cherry chipotle barbecue sauce, because that's the, the path that this sauce kind of takes. Wow. That sounds amazing. Well, I'm looking forward to trying that sometime soon. Oh, Thanks we'll for sharing that, all that. That happened, man. We'll make that happen. Yeah. So uh, next question for you, and this is a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but I gave you five minutes, and in five minutes, you, give it a spe- you get to give a speech to the world. You think, about, think of this as like your state of the union. It's like you get to speak to the whole world, and you are a speaker, so uh, you may have already done this, probably not to the whole world, but you've maybe done a five-minute speech before. And you could deliver any message to the world. What would you actually get? What would you give your speech on? And why? It would be, and this won't surprise you at all. It would be on the, on the fact that whatever happened to you matters only to the degree that it taught you something. Oh, I that love it, that. That in fact, everything that happens to us on our journey and, and I don't care, however you want to believe it happens. If you want to believe it's chance, believe it's chance. If you want to believe it's divine intervention, believe that. If you want to believe it's the universe delivering or God or however you, it doesn't matter. Our journey has moments that teach us. Sometimes they're painful and we learn from the pain. Sometimes they're positive, we learn from the positive. 
And I believe that's why we're here, because we experience that journey, we learn those things, and then that equips us to serve others. And those others will be brought into our path as we travel through our life. And it is our job to have our message ready so that we can teach them what they need to know, because we're the people they have to learn it from. That's why they've been brought into our path. Mm -hmm. That might be a little metaphysical or whatever, but it's the way I see the world. And I have seen it occur so many times, I'm convinced it's true. Mm -hmm. So I would spend my five minutes convincing you that no matter how bad what happened to you was, there's a lesson in there. And if you can unlock that lesson, you will discover why you're here. And so then that thing about, you know, that we hear about two best days of your life or the day you're born and the day you discover why, mm -hmm. that discover why. And yeah, you know my personal beautiful. story. I have that difficult moment that happened, that difficult thing that happened in life. And when I finally figured out what it meant, it just changed everything. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a message. Uh, it's a message that it, the world definitely needs to hear. Next question for you. What's something that is inside of your comfort zone that it might be outside of somebody else's comfort zone? Listening and figuring out what stuff means. And, and Jason, what I, what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of my work has been facilitation of conversations, processes, strategic planning, leadership development, culture. And the, the gift thing that, you know, I was given that I don't know where it came from. And it creates a real challenge, right? Because there are moments when I would hear myself say something, and I'll go, where did that come from? I didn't consciously think of that. I didn't create that. Somehow it came through me. And it's, it's that ability to do that that I am so comfortable with. I can just freak other people out when you ask them to do it. Because it's one thing to ask a question of a group of people, probe and pull and, and prod until people really release what they're thinking about it. And to be able to see it from a high level and say, okay, this is how all that fits together. That, you know, that's a very cool skill to have. And I don't know where I got mm -hmm. it, but I have it. But for most yeah. people, they will say, how, how can you do that? How did you figure all that out from that? And if you have the gift and it's in your comfort zone, it is so easy. You can't, you have trouble explaining how you do it because you don't even know. And, you know, this happens to me a lot. I don't mean this arrogantly. It's just a reality. Mm -hmm. We'll be in a conversation. And I'll be asking questions because that's what I do. We can talk more about why I do that later. Yeah. But I, I prefer to ask questions, even though I love to talk, because it helps me learn. And at times, after asking a number of questions, I will see something or something will come through me and I'll say something. And it is not at all unusual for someone to say, can you say that again? And here's the sad thing, Jason. I can't because I don't mm -hmm. even it in the first place. I don't really, I didn't, it's not like I took time to formulate the sentence in my, in my head to say it. It just came together. And I said, well, that sounds like what you mean is this. And people go, yes, I got to write that down. It's one of the reasons <laughs> I write everything I do, because I never know when that thing's coming because it, it doesn't come from me. It comes through me. And while yeah. that sounds weird, there are lots of people that can attest to the fact this is an experience we have. But to those who, who don't have that experience, that's got to be outside the comfort zone. And it's almost weird and frightening to them because yeah. it's kind of threatening. You know, oh gosh, this person can see inside of me. Kind of weird. Yeah. That, it, my friend, I forget what it, the title is, but it's, he it has a name for this, but it's the thing that we so naturally do that we don't even have to think about it. Like, I think all of us as human beings have like something or a few things that we do that is so easy for us that we almost assume, and I had this happen to me last month actually that we assume that it's like that for other people. But I had it reflected to me by one of my friends that the thing that I'm, something that I, that I am, you know, really good at or inside of my comfort zone. She told me that for her, it's so outside, not even outside her comfort zone. She literally doesn't understand it. And I'm like, how would you not understand this? It's so <laughs> on the, on the note, no, like, so on the nose. So right in front of you, it's so like natural and easy to do. And she's like, for you, yeah. for me, for, for her, she was like, this is, this is insane that you know how to do this. And I've been coming to realize through my work with, you know, like coaching, uh, like coaching people and just getting to know people like the HPS community and such. That it's, it's just that it's like this thing that we're built that we have this thing we're so good at 
And we're like, oh yeah, easy. No, that might be the thing that's the hardest thing for somebody else. So I think for you, that's one, my experience of you is that you do see a lot, you ask a lot of good questions and you have a lot of things that come out because I think you're, you're pretty extroverted. So you're doing a lot of processing on the fly. And I, I know other people, other people in my sphere of influence that are quite the opposite. Like they may be able to see a lot, but then they have to formulate that response for 10 seconds, minute, or maybe they have to write it down, or maybe they have to tell you the next day. They just, they're just not ready to um, have it delivered through them in that moment. And that's something you're naturally very, uh, you have an amazing skill of, you know, to deliver that in the moment, like you just said. So thank you for sharing that. And Jason, when you say that, it's interesting because I realized something. The gift is not what I described. The gift, you know, the comfort zone is I am very comfortable verbally processing ideas. I have no concern about whether somebody's going to judge it right or wrong because I'm still thinking through it. And when you meet people who can't do that, it freaks them out that you just talked and then all of a sudden you said, oh, well, it really means this, doesn't it? And they went, holy cow, that is what it means. Because they can't do that kind of processing. And that's, you know, yeah. I, I enjoy having that gift. And it's sometimes there's times I wish somebody else had it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Because, because the reality is, it, it, the other thing, there's a downside, right? There's a downside to any massive gifting we have. It, it, we're in the jar. So we can do it for everybody else, but we can't do it for ourselves. Because there's that's that right. we need to label when we're in the jar. Well, when we're in our jar, that gift we have is useless to us. And that's frustrating. Yeah, which is why people like you and I uh, have thriving client practices because um, the things that we can, the things that people can do for themselves or the things they can do for others, they can't do for themselves, which is why one of the main reasons I think why you work with a coach or work with, work with a consultant or um, work with a business partner, whatever that may be. And so, if we this whole conversation boils down to this. That which is amazing to others, or excuse me, that which is, is obvious to you is often amazing to others. Yeah, I love that. Or hidden or, you know, invisible. Yeah, I, I might steal that. Is that trademarked? Not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by the end of this podcast. Find the domain uh, as we talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that. So um, I want to flip the script on this question for you. Oh. So what's something that's outside of your comfort zone? that is inside of somebody else's comfort zone. Well, it's interesting. You know, you, you said something a moment ago, and I, I have to come back to it, and it kind of fits. Uh, extroversion is actually outside of my comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. I, am, I, I am described myself as an introvert, you know, on the Myers-Briggs, for example. I'm an INFJ, which is, you know, supposedly the rarest personality type in the Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm the introvert who needs to recover. I can go all out, and I can... I don't, I don't want to say I can convince in the sense that I'm trying to convince you, but my behavior will convince you I'm an extrovert. What I am is an interested introvert. And I'm mm -hmm. going to seem like an extrovert to people because I'm asking questions. And when a door gets opened where I can reveal something, I'm going to reveal it because I can't not do that. We just talked about it. Yeah. But at the same time, my introversion is sometimes going, okay, it's time for me to leave where I am. I, I can't stay here. And I know there are other people who thrive on being there and keeping the party going and so forth. And if, even if I'm the guy who is the last to leave, if I'm the guy who's the last to leave the party, here's what I will tell you, you have observed. I have disappeared into a corner at some point and gotten into a real good intimate conversation with someone. Mm. I'm not the guy who's dancing on the table. <laughs> the guy dancing on the table may be on table, me. But that's a separate conversation. And, <laughs> and, and I'll let you do that because I know you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the guy who uh, is the last man standing because I'm a complete extrovert. And I probably talked to every single person at the bar about something at some point. So but we, may, we may or may not have had a serious conversation, but we, we probably had a fun one regardless. And see, here's an example, right? We were at HPS. You know, I, I'm a teaching fellow, as you know, there now. Mm -hmm. yep. I was at the last grad. And six of us decided to go to the Salt House. Mm -hmm. Well, you know how that can happen at HPS six suddenly turned into 18. Yep. And my introversion had to retreat. Mm. And there was one person that we had talked about having a conversation about something. So when I started to feel that I looked across the table at her and I said, and I sort of waved at her, 
and we went over, you know, the, the little two top table that's behind that six top that's upstairs in the front window. Yeah. We yep. Little table and had a conversation. I was able to do my introvert recovery thing and then go back. But those other people who were there, most of them were in the extrovert mode and they were very happy to be there deeply engaged in a big conversation. And I just had to get away. So, yeah. so that's, that's the, you know, it's outside of my comfort zone to be in that situation for too long. Whereas I know it's very much inside some other. people. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing both of those. That's both, both very fascinating. So the next thing I want to ask you about is what are you passionate about? So I know you're obviously passionate about smoking meat. You're passionate about uh, the work you do. Yeah. What else are you, what are you most passionate about or what are you passionate about? Jason, for me, passion is really about one thing. It's about human potential. I mean, as long as I can remember, and I mean this from elementary school, I have wanted to see people live up to what they're capable of living up to. And I don't know where it came from. It's just, it's just been a part of me. You know, if I watched a kid trying to do something, you know, on the monkey bars, even though I was not athletic and still am not, I would try to push them to keep trying until they got as much as they could get of what they were trying to do. I'm just wired that way. And even the introvert I was then, I was still kind of born to teach, you know, so mm-hmm. I'd have I'd ask questions. I'd learn. It's like, oh, okay. So the way you actually do that is you put your hands this way instead of that way. And so nothing ever, nothing fulfills me more than seeing a person begin to step into who they were made to be. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I love the heroic public speaking community that we're both involved with is because that's part of what people come there and do. They step into who they really were born to be. Yeah. And, you know, that's true at every, at every level of life. The reason I became a college professor was exactly that. I loved the research. I was good at it. It fed my introversion. But I reached that moment in my master's program where I went to my major professor and I said, you know, I really need to get back to where I'm seeing people become who they are. Now, I need to teach. And that's why I went and got a PhD and went into that line because, you know, there was nothing more powerful to me than when my new advisees would walk in or and they'd have all the excuses already in their head of why they were going to not succeed. And I yeah. was able to sort of ask enough questions until I could get them to talk about the times when they did succeed and help them begin to see that they can succeed here too, and then to watch them. So that's what yeah. I've done. Corporate work, it's what I do in my one-on-one counseling, coaching, consulting, in my mastermind groups I lead. It, it's all about human potential and living up for whatever you're capable of doing. And when you get to the level that's the best you can do today, how do we raise the bar and push you to the next level? Yeah. I uh, want to ask you a follow-up about that. It's something when you were speaking, I was, um, this just hit me. How do you feel when you see somebody not living up to their potential? Uh, maybe it's a coaching client. Maybe it's uh, one of your corporate clients where you have a, an amazing session or a group of sessions or, you know, like a whole engagement. And then at the end of it, you see something for them and they, for whatever reason, it just doesn't come to fruition. How do you feel about that? And what, what's your reaction to that? There's only one word. It's anger. I you mean, get angry. It, I'm not surprised. It, it, it's like my friend Mike Kim has his, his three personal branding questions. You know, what pisses you off? What breaks your heart? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Yep. And what pisses me off is to see people who know better fall back into old patterns that they know didn't work. It, it's, you know, Les Brown used to tell this story. You know who Les Brown was, the motivational I story? do. Yep. He used to tell this story about a guy walking down the street and every once in a while, off in the distance, he hears this, oh, and he doesn't know what it is. He just keeps walking and it keeps getting louder and more frequent. Oh, oh. Finally, he gets up to this house and there's a man sitting on the front porch and there's a dog laying beside. And every once in a while, the dog raises his head and goes, oh, and he says, hey, man, what's wrong with your dog? He said, he's laying on a nail. He said, well, why didn't he move? Well, it doesn't hurt enough to move. It hurts enough to sit there and go, oh, every once in a while. Well, there's a lot of people, Jason, laying on nails doing that every day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It pisses me off because they could change that, and they don't realize that change decision is something within their power. Most yeah. powerful afternoon I ever spent was, I, was there was a book coming, coming out of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series called Chicken Soup for the Prisoner's Soul. And for the, the prisoners, did you say for the prisoner's soul? Yes, for the prisoner's soul. Got it. 
And the guy who co-authored the book with Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen was a guy from Delaware. And he organized an afternoon where all of our professional speaking friends went into a prison here in Delaware called Gander Hill. And we were assigned a group full of people and we had a topic. So I was assigned the addiction recovery group. So I walked in a, into a room with 90 inmates and I had 75 minutes with them. And what I had been asked to talk about was goal setting. And Jason, these, you know, these gentlemen were all over the age spectrum. They were, you know, the, the, the group was racially structured as one would know it would be if you know anything about how our prison systems are. Mm -hmm. And as I'm talking about goals with a whiteboard here and just laying out three basic concepts, because, you know, the, these are recovering addicts and we're trying to help them understand goals because they're setting a goal to break free of the addiction they have. When I watched an old man midway through begin crying and shaking his head, and I watched a young man in front feverishly taking notes on this little tiny slip of paper that he had because he really didn't have the resources to have anything else. We weren't allowed to bring in handouts or anything. Mm -hmm. And the meeting came to an end, and those two people came to me. And the old man looked at me, still with tears in his eyes, and he said, Son, I so wish I had met you 30 years ago. My life would have been so much different. And then the young guy who's standing there with him says, how can I learn more about this? Can you send me something? If I give you my address, can you mail me a book on this or something? Because I, I need to know this. I, I didn't know you were allowed to make decisions about your own life. I thought that wow. just, you know, you can imagine what I felt like. Oh, man. Yeah. That's very moving. But, it, but it, it also taps into that thing is, you know, I, I am, I'm standing there and my heart is broken by seeing that here are two men who have ended up in a place because nobody ever told them they had a choice. And they never realized they could do something different. Well, you know, there are a lot of people, Jason, in that same prison in their mind. There are a lot of people in the same prison on the job. There are a lot of mm -hmm. people in prison in a relationship. There are a lot of people in that same prison because their parents don't believe they can do better. They know they can, but they're being held back. There are a lot of people in that same prison because of something bad that happened in their life. So, you know, my passion is how do I help them move past that? How do I help them unlock that? Yeah. That's really cool, Michael. Uh, so yeah. I... We're going there, but I, I had forgotten no, that. Quite emotionally touched right now, just remembering that moment. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. I, um, a few years ago, my wife and I and some of our coworkers, we ran a, um, uh, there's a, a really amazing nonprofit called Citizen Schools. And they, they partner up with uh, large corporations and teach after school programs. And we actually taught a shark tank at a school in the Bronx cool. and for, um, for seventh and eighth graders. So they actually competed as teams. They came up with an idea, you know, did the design, and then they got to pitch in front of uh, an audience of uh, tech entrepreneurs and such, their ideas. And I, I remember as well, uh, some of the kids there were there because they got the free snacks, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there was, but there, was some, there was a few kids there that told us afterwards that, that they felt like this was a moment in their life where they believed that they had a choice and that somebody believed in them. And because, because they weren't getting that at home, they were, you know, in, in with their classmates where their classmates weren't, their friends maybe weren't on the right path, but they mm -hmm. had an aspiration to do something, but they felt like they didn't have a choice. And allowing them to uh, just see that there is another possibility than what's just what you believe to be your possibility can be so powerful. And I say that for everybody listening that you never know when you might be that person. So like you didn't know walking into that prison, like you knew you walked into that prison that you wanted to make an impact on those, on those people's lives. But you didn't know that there was that specific uh, younger, the younger uh, inmate that you were talking about, that perhaps you changed the, his, his life. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know that. And so I, I say all that for everybody listening, that when we're interacting with people, no matter where we are, to be thinking about like, this can be the day. This can be the day when I can create that impact for somebody. This can be the day that I can actually change somebody's trajectory and being like, what does that mean to you? And how do you interact with people when you have that mindset? What does that look like? 
Well, I, got, uh, I got very emotional hearing your story as well, Michael. I was just that was such a beautiful story. It's that callback, Jason, to what I was talking about earlier, right? You know, that person is going to cross your path. And I think sometimes we hold back too much thinking we have to have the messaging perfect or we have to know how to say it, or we have to know how to touch and change hundreds of lives. You know, here's the thing. If you've got something that pisses you off, that breaks your heart, and you know there's a problem you can help that people solve so they escape whatever that is, then you have an obligation to share it, even if it only helps one. Because that one may help another, and that one may help another, and that one will help another. And, and, you know, we shouldn't shy away from that because we think it can't change someone's life because we never know. I mean, we, you know, we all see the memes about things. We never know what's going on in someone else's life at this moment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, here's the beauty of this, right? It happens in a nanosecond in a statement that comes out of your mouth you didn't even plan or think about but that happens to hit that person at a moment when they're receptive to it. You know, it's a little bit like marketing, right? We can market till we're blue in the face, to use an old hackneyed phrase, and nobody ever listens. And then we can say the same message tomorrow and 10 people listen while we find out what's the difference. The difference is something happened last night in the lives of each of those 10 people that made them need the solution we've been talking about in our marketing work. You know, and the mistake we make in business, obviously, was we only say it once and think they all got it the first time. You know, you don't get excited about the mattress commercials until your bed's broke. <laughs> you know? That's very true. And if the commercial wasn't continuing, you wouldn't know what, what you wanted in terms of a bed. You know, and that's an odd way to go. But, you know, you get the message. Yeah. Yeah. That's really amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Michael. Um, we've, been, we've been alluding to this the whole time. And you've been, sh- you've been sprinkling this throughout. Uh, love to hear a little bit more about your general philosophy of life. Like what's the, you know, yeah, just that. What's your, what's your philosophy on life? You can do more than you believe you can, and you're supposed to do it regardless of the risks. And, and, you know, and, and what that translates to Jason is the journey can be long and arduous. The journey can be costly. The journey can subject you to different, you know, difficulties along the way. You know, I made a decision five years ago to pivot my work. I sold a business that I'd been running for 17 years and sort of decided it was time to really pursue my passion in part because of what the question you asked earlier. I did an exercise where I realized 65% of the clients I was working with were pissing me off every day because Mm -hmm. they weren't in action. They weren't doing anything. They were just going through the motions and I can't stand just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to show up and go all in and play all out, I'm not the guy for you. You know, mm-hmm. and when, when you start, when you discover that, you realize you're going to change it. You know, you can't just, you know, snapping your fingers is hard on a microphone, but you can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. It takes time. You know, today is November 6th. That's right. I, be- I believe the date was November 7th of 2014 when I made that decision. And, you know, that has only all started to truly come together for me in the past 12, 15 months. And in large part, that's because I was ignoring the fact it was my responsibility to change things. Mm -hmm. I was coaching other people to do it. I was pushing them to. But, you know, when you met me, um, you know, I weighed 60 pounds more than I do today. Mm -hmm. And two months before that, I weighed 80 pounds more than I do today. And the simple reality is I was wearing a fat suit. And I had been wearing a fat suit for my entire life from the age of 10. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I might as well share this with your audience. I don't hide it from anybody because sure. here's the point. there may be someone listening that this will help. You know, um, in, you know, I, I was a verbal processor my entire life. You know, I understand the world by talking through. Um, when I was 10 years old, I had something happen to me. I'm okay. There's no need for anybody to worry about me. I've worked through it. In fact, I finally have really worked through it now, but I was raped and molested for a year by someone who threatened to kill me. Mm-hmm. Now, if you understand the world by talking through things, and someone tells you they'll kill you if you talk about the very thing that is hurting you the most at that moment, you shut down. And the truth is, I shut down for years. You know, it took me until I was in my 20, mid-20s to get comfortable stepping to the front of the room to speak, despite the fact that's all I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. In my mid-30s, when I'm riding a career high, suddenly I start experiencing depression. And I don't know why, because I have blocked these memories out. 
And I have the afternoon, Jason, where I'm sitting in a counselor's office after I finally decided I needed help. And we've been there, I've been there for 13 consecutive weeks, Jason. The 14th week, I walk in and he asked me a question. I look at him. I said, not today. I said, I've answered enough questions. Aren't you going to tell me something? Now, can't you yeah. figure anything? I said, I've told you my entire life story. He looked at me and he nodded his head and he said, yeah, I know. He said, and I probably should have. He said, but there's a problem. Something's missing. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, have you told me everything? I said, dude, there's nothing you haven't heard that I can think of. Why are you asking? He said, because everything about what you're saying shapes up like the victim mentality. And you've never, ever mentioned being a victim. And Jason, the minute he said that, literally, it was as though he pushed a VCR button in my head. And I saw a video play of the worst case of the abuse that happened. Yeah. And I sat there on the couch and cried for three solid hours. Because every bit of it came rushing back and came through my brain. Now, I did a bit to work on it then, but when I thought I was getting better, I walked away. And what I did is what I had done in the first place. I put on the mask and the suit. I started Mm -hmm. pretending to be who I thought I was going to be, the person who couldn't and wouldn't talk about it and didn't have to because I'd been very successful in my life since by not talking about it. So I wasn't going to start now. And The reality is what was getting me through was medicating myself with sugar. Now, sugar sometimes was in the form of alcohol, Mm -hmm. but it was also in the form of an awful lot of cupcakes, but (laughs) we all that, but little Debbie wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for me, brother. Uh, And, you know, so I put, I put the mask and the suit back on, right. And I went back to, to working and doing things and sort of ignoring all of it. And, you know, um, then I had the day when my father died. And suddenly I was the, you know, my mother and father are both gone. And I was sort of in, I mean, I was married and happily married. But as I was processing all of that, I realized you never dealt with what happened to you. You just kept ignoring it. And now that you've had this other big emotional hammer drop, and now that the people you should have told are both not here, you have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I launched on the journey. Now, you know, it, it took time there, right? So we loop back to my point about how things take time. My father passed away in. December of 20, November rather of 2011. It wasn't until 2017 that I finally realized what that path needed to look like. And that's what led me to HPS because I had to decide if I was going to tell that story. I just told your audience. Yeah. And originally I would tell you a whole lot more, you know, with four part harmony and, you know, double drums and everything else. Now I tell it as one sentence with a couple setup sentences, not to discount it, but because all I need to do is let someone know you can go past that if you'll do the work. And I have learned that there's always someone who needs to hear that to realize it doesn't have to hold you back. It doesn't have to be in your way. And so, you know, in philosophy of life, it really sort of loops back to what is that stuff you learn? Because my fundamental philosophy is if I learn it, there's someone who needs to learn it and they need to learn it from me. And it's my job to present it to them. Whether it's how to move through something difficult, whether it's how to create a vision and speak it into existence, whether it's how to live up to your potential, but that's why I'm here. The reason I was wired as a verbal processor is to use my voice to help other people. And my philosophy of life is find as many moments as I can where I can speak into someone else's life and help them move past whatever obstacle is currently there and remind them or perhaps inform them for the first time that they're in control of their mind, their mind is not in control of them. Yeah. And they can choose to think differently and that they have to do that as step. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, A little intense there. Sorry. (laughs) No, no, no. And that's no, it's, it's a, it's a great message. I, (laughs) I'm no, but I'm, I'm feeling called. If there's somebody listening to this podcast, and you could, you know, I think you just gave a great message. How, how would you summarize that lesson for them in one or two sentences? Like, what's the thing that you think people that, that have, have got some sort of traumatic event or something that, that is, uh, you know, from a victim place or just a, a limiting belief in themselves, a story that they tell themselves? What would you tell that person if you had like one or two sentences? 
right now? It starts by mapping your life so you become aware of what those moments were and what they meant. Very simple exercise. Yeah. Take, a, take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, turn it sideways, draw a line across the middle. On the left-hand side, put the date you were born. On the right-hand side, put the day's date, then break that into five to six equal increments. Above the line, you're drawing lines that have a height that represents how positive something was that happened. Below the line, you're drawing a line that the depth represents how negative it was. Mm -hmm. Map the two to three most positive and negative events in each of those five blocks, and then sit down and think about it. Yeah, and think about with this question in mind, what did this stuff teach me? What did this stuff reveal to me that I'm ignoring and that I'm not living my life taking advantage of? And that I'm here to share with other people. That one simple exercise can change the way you interact with yourself and with everybody in your life. And it takes about a half hour. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, I did that exercise with our friend, with our friend Howie Kra um, mm -hmm. on, a, on a drive one day when he called me. And I had six hours on the road. And we spent about four and a half of it talking and working through the exercise. And he will tell you it was life changing. For me yeah. Because. And not because of anything I did, right? This is not, you know, I didn't come up with this concept. There's lots of people that have life mapping institutes and do things of this nature all the time. But if you map your life, there were moments put there for a reason. So the question is, did you figure out what that reason was and what did you learn from that? And are you using it and who else needs to know it? To me, it's that simple. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and that's not easy, but it's that simple. Simple and yeah. easier. To yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> Simple to start, not an easy process to, uh, to get all the way through, but, it, but definitely worth doing. So you just alluded to this, and the, the next question I think is a, is a natural thing as we get near the end of the time, we still have some time left though, yeah. is I think the audience would be interested to hear about your journey from where you've come from to your journey to you and I sitting here together today. So uh, just to summarize what we've heard about so far, uh, you had a traumatic event when you were, when you were 10. You've, uh, you were a college professor at the University of Illinois, and you are currently a coach, consultant, and professional keynote speaker. And, of course, a uh, semi-professional smoker <laughs> on the, on the, on the uh, Komodo Joe. So, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey. Like, uh, you know, start where you'd like, and let's end where we're sitting here today. And, and Jason, I'll do it not in a bragging sense, but I'll do it sort of in a in a curriculum vita sense because there are. Yeah, you can. I'd love to hear you brag. I'm I'm happy to hear you brag. You 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 do you. <laughs> well, you know, I I was the shy kid, right? I mean, you know, what what popped into my life right around the time that the uh, bad stuff happened it was a thing called 4-H. And you know, your audience, many of them probably have never heard of it because it was a rural type agricultural program. But you know, the H's stand for head, heart, hands, and health. And the local 4-H club met next door to my house. And so I went there when I was nine. And at the end of the year, I had one of those moments where I got blamed for something I didn't even know I was supposed to do, so I quit. And then I discovered how powerful my father was and how many people knew. It's about a week later, this little red car pulls up in the driveway, and this guy gets out, and he comes in, and I don't know who he is. I've never met the man. I just see him walking in. It turns out he's the county 4-H agent, and 4-H has agents in every county. It's part of the Cooperative Extension Service, which if you want to know more about then you, you know, <laughs> we're in a word, you can Google it and learn, but every county had extension. This gentleman was the 4-H agent, and he said, I understand you uh, decided to quit 4-H that your dad was telling me. I said, yeah. I said, Cause I, he said, well, how come? And I told him, and it was because the leader had treated me in a way that I didn't think was appropriate. I mean, I was only nine, but I still had feelings. And he said, well, I'm going to encourage you to give it another shot because I, I think it's a lot to offer you. And he said, you know, that wasn't appropriate. That shouldn't have happened. He said, would it be okay if I picked you up next week and took you to the county on some contest? I think it was like a, a weed contest where you had to identify weeds or something. I don't know. Um, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. I, I, but, <laughs> Identifying but, you know, weeds. <laughs> you know, my dad asked me to listen to him and, you know, I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went, well, you know, without telling you the four part harmony story of that, uh, that changed my life because it took me out of my home area. You know, I was a fat kid, Jason. I was medicating myself with sugar. I was chosen for every pickup team in my life as the last person chosen with the following lovely words, we'll take fat boy. 
and living in your own and and I would ride the bus to school every day where every Monday I would get beat up on the bus. And the reason I get beat up on the bus every Monday is my dad was a cop. And every Saturday night he would be called because we live closest to this family where every Saturday night the husband would get drunk and start beating the wife. And when she called the police, they called the closest officer to go deal with. Mm. So I'd get on the bus Monday morning with the two sons who would beat the snot. And all of that made 4-H incredibly appealing. Why? Because it had a lot of stuff at the county level. So I was able to sort of get out of the local world that I lived in every day. Mm -hmm. It just opened doors for me. And it challenged me and it pushed me. And, and suddenly I was part of something bigger than me. So that was a really powerful thing in my life. Now, another powerful thing happened right around that same time, which is what led to my being a professional speaker. We had a speaker come into our, our elementary school named John Jimenez. And John was a recovering heroin addict from the Bronx, actually, Bronx or Brooklyn. And he moved to, uh, ultimately ended up in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and started a huge church. But he told these vivid stories of his journey into heroin addiction and then out and then falling back. And Jason, I was the ADHD kid. I sat there, not able to pay attention most of the time. And all of a sudden, I found myself with my elbows on my knees riveted as he told these stories. Mm -hmm. That's right around the time when the bad things were happening to me. And story became my path through. So I began reading voraciously. I had this little thing called the Bookmobile, which was a Winnebago library on wheels that would come to the corner just down from where we lived every mm -hmm. two. And, you know, I would get six books, which was the maximum you could get. My mother built a relationship with a woman who drove it so I could get six books every three days because that's how fast I was going through them. Wow. My salvation. Now, fast forward, I'm in graduate school. I've found research as a way to something I'm good at and I'm good at teaching and I've decided to go get a PhD and I've accepted a teaching assistantship. I am still petrified to step to the front of the room. But really? The day, but the day comes when I have to go teach 250 freshmen introductory economics. And this is back in the days of the acetate overheads, you know, that you actually, you didn't have pen plotters to print them. You had to do them by hand. Mm -hmm. I sat in my office. I prepared all my overheads. You know, I had my sport coat on, my khaki pants, my tie. Looked as preppy as I could get. And I left my office to go teach this class. Scared to death. Passed the first building, got about 10 steps past it, turned around, walked back, ran inside, found a men's room, and puked my guts out. Wow. Pulled myself together, started walking again, got to the next building, passed it, did the same thing. I get to the third building, which is the building where the classroom is, and I do it one last time. And there's nothing left at this point, but, you know. Yeah. Had, it, it just, I had one more time I had to, I walk out and across the hall of the auditorium doors to where these 250 kids await. And I'm literally standing there, Jason, holding a notebook. that has got all these overheads in it. I got my little pens and everything. I'm ready. And my knees are shaking and it looks like it's a hundred yards away. And I have no idea how I'm going to cross this and go in this room because they don't have cell phones, right? When I start walking up the room, they're going to see me. Yeah. <laughs> nothing yeah. else. To but look and go, who's the new dude, you know? <laughs> yeah. And this, this happened as, as true as you and I meeting happened. I suddenly looked at those doors and I saw the image of John Jimenez standing on stage telling these stories that riveted my attention. And I literally started hearing this refrain in my head. Tell him a story, teach him a lesson. Tell him a story, teach him a lesson. And as each step I took towards that room, that voice grew louder. And as I opened the doors, the voice stopped. And as I walked down the aisle, my brain starts searching, saying, what story can I tell a bunch of freshmen that's going to make them give a hoot about a supply curve? Yeah. And as I got to the stage and there were three steps up, I hit the second step. And I remembered the day that I reversed the supply and demand curves on an exam in my master's program and almost flunked out. And I said, I'll tell them that story. And then I'll tell them that I'm going to teach it to them in a way they'll never forget it. So that'll never happen to them. So I walked up and shaking, turned the overhead projector on, put the opening slide up, stepped aside, and told him that story. Then I taught the lesson. And for the first time in my life, I realized 
I knew I wanted to be here and I was born to be here and now I'm comfortable here. Yeah. And all the fear was gone. <clears throat> and that's so what how- opened the door to me becoming a professional speaker. Yeah, that's amazing, Michael. So how many, so since that moment, how many hours do you think you've spent in front of a, in front of some sort of decent sized audience speaking? You know, someone challenged me to calculate it one time and over a couple of glasses of scotch, we did. <laughs> and I can, I can name it this way. I could count 8,000 paid professional speeches. And, you know, those would be 8,000. Yeah. And those would be anywhere from, you know, 15 minutes in length in some cases, most cases more like an hour at a minimum, but, and some being full day. But across 35 years, uh, that's how many times I've been in front of audiences. And that was calculated probably five years ago. So yeah. it's been a lot, my man. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, what hits me about that is 8,000 hours in front of people from the kid who uh, is introverted. Mm-hmm. It's got the, it's just the crap beat out of you. The kid who had a very traumatic event, uh, verbal processor, and was told if they ever talked about something that he would be literally be killed the kid who well the young man who is the professor who threw up three times and since that time in your journey you've done this eight thousand times Mm -hmm. there's a lesson for everybody in that because it i think i'll speaking for myself i i tend to see people uh, and this is a bias or a context that i have that i know is not true and this goes back to what I said when I first met you. I look at, oh, there's a professional speaker. He's a natural. He's always done this. It's not true. I mean, it's obviously not true that that was, this is the thing that you've worked at. And it's, it's true to who you are and who you want to be and what you love to do. But it required practice and grit and determination for you to be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish in the public speaking field today. I think there's a, such a powerful lesson that no matter who we think makes it look easy, easy, we don't really know the journey that comes behind that and the, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the laughter, the joy, the heartbreak that comes with people that are finally getting aligned to do the things that they, say, that, they, that they actually want to do. Like you said, I think you said it, it wasn't until five years ago when you sold your business because you were tired of doing that and now you finally get to do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Only five years ago. And part of what drives me, Jason, is to help people do it sooner. Yeah. You know, and it's not that the ride was bad, okay? I don't want anybody to misread what I'm saying. I was very blessed and very fortunate to be able to do what I've done. But when I was challenged by Michael Bungay Stanier, who delivered a keynote speech where he talked about his, what's in his book, Do More Great Work, mm-hmm. and I decided that there's good work, bad work, and great work, that bad work is wombat, a waste of money, bandwidth, and time. <laughs> I like that. Good work is your job description. You're good at it. If you don't do it, it doesn't get done. But great work is the life-altering work you're here to do. And then he asks us to complete a pie chart and label our work. And I label 65% bad and 5% great and the rest good. And I said, this isn't acceptable. Yeah. I, I'm not going to keep doing this. Now, had there been moments in my life before then when that balance was different? Absolutely. But I had let it slip and I had let it slip because I was being lazy. I had let it slip because I wasn't pushing myself. I had let it slip because I had some voices in my head that still thought I wasn't good enough and that I had to live up and chase accolades because I didn't deserve any better because of what happened to me. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's just BS. You know, it's, it's the head trash that needs to be taken out every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Yeah. Because none of what happened to you defines you today. And I know I sound like every motivational speaker on the planet, but it's the truth. And there is that thing inside of every one of us we know we have to do. And you got to have the guts to step out and do it. Because if you don't, then there are going to be people who, are, who don't get what they need. Because when they cross your path, you're not there to give it. Yeah. And, yeah. and that just sort of summarizes everything we've talked about today to me, because, you know, there, there's no magic in how many times you get in the front of the room. You just keep swinging, you know, and, and obviously the academic world served me well. And, you know, I do count all of my teaching of students as that because I was being paid mm-hmm. to do that. I used to teach sure. seven classes a semester. And you teach seven classes a semester, you're in the front of the room a lot. And you also fail a lot in front of an audience that's pretty tough. Yeah. And, 
you, you kind of got to get good or get out or just accept the fact that they're going to talk about how lousy you are. And I couldn't accept that. <laughs> so, and now so I'm ready to get better. <laughs> and now there's all sorts of uh, websites that you can go on and say and rate your professors. Yeah. So now it's even harder for, for people in academia because it, as a student, you can go on and say, hey, like Dr. Michael Hudson, his class is amazing or this class down the hallway is boring. And you can see that before you even have to step into the room. You know, if, if you boil it all down, Jason, I want one thing for your audience. I want them to be ready when their moment arrives. Because you don't know when the moment's going to arrive. You know, the whole thing that launched my business that I ran for 17 years and then sold was the fact that I was a breakout speaker in a room that was the room right next to where the keynote had been given. Mm-hmm. The keynote speaker missed the mark. She just missed the mark with this audience. And she was in this large room with a breakout session scheduled right after the keynote. And I was in the tiny room next to her doing another breakout. And I think there were two others. Well, I was the closest person to that room. Most of the people bailed from the room before she was even done. When I walked into the room to see mine, it was full already. And as I began talking, because I was prepared, because I had done the work, all of a sudden, they're bringing in more chairs, and there are people standing in the hallway. Now, when a meeting planner tells her colleagues in an industry that we had to bring in extra chairs, and there were people standing in the hallway to hear this presentation, it's not real hard to book the next 15 presentations in that industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it kind of happens very and, – and, and none of that has squat to do with me. It has to do with the point I make. The preparation meets the opportunity at the moment. And if you've done the preparation, you're ready. And we've all heard this before, but you're ready to deliver in a way that opens a door you could never have opened any other way. That's right. That's right. You always have to be ready. And the way you're ready is by preparing, 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 preparing. And I know you, you're a, you're a man of great preparation. So when that moment came, you took it and the trajectory of, of your life completely changed. Dude, I, I, you know, I was wearing the lavalier mic, right? So when they started gathering in the hall, I just acknowledged the rest of the people. I said, guys in the room, I said, I'm going to sneak out to the back here. Stay with me. I said, we've got a bunch of people in the hallway, and I, I want to make sure they can hear. And I walked out to see if they could hear. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and, and only because, you know, we're there to serve them. Our discussion today, our objective has been one thing, right, is to serve the people listening. That's you right. Know, motivate them to think differently about what's possible for them so they can go make something happen that they didn't realize they could make happen. Which, by the way, Jason, is all I do in my work. I yep. help people unlock that message, unlock that journey, identify where they've been, what does it mean, what are the lessons, and how do you create a proprietary framework around that that lets you then serve the people you're here to serve? Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing all that today. Uh, on that note, I'd love if you could share where the audience can find you. Like, well, where can you find out more about your work? Uh, if you've got uh, a web presence, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat. Uh, billboard somewhere, anything you've got for us, we'd love to hear about it. Old. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and it's all at Dr. Michael Hudson. Uh, because sure. when, I got my, when, I, when I got my handles, Michael Hudson was already taken because there's a bunch of us on the planet, but I used mm-hmm. Dr. I was able to get that one. Website's just michaelhudson.com. And, you know, the, the typical path for me to engage with people, Jason, is for us to have a conversation to see if I'm the right person to help them. And, you know, if you're mm-hmm. interested in that, just send an email to michael at michaelhudson.com and I'll follow up and send you a link so you can schedule a conversation. And if, uh, if I can help you unlock that message and figure out what it means and who it's for and how you can leverage it in your work, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an ex- expert as in a speaker, coach, or consultant, a small business owner, a nonprofit leader, I, I tend to work all across that range. And, and frankly, Jason, the people I can tend to help best are people kind of where you are right now, which is sort of you know, making a transition from where you were to where you want to be. Yeah. In, in part, yep. because it's the thing I've done in my life multiple times. So I seem to be, I seem to have some capacity to teach people how to avoid the pitfalls, overcome the obstacles. <laughs> learning curve because I had to figure it out myself. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. And I'll, I'll be sure and include all of your, all of the uh, places we can find you on the show notes as well. So last thing, and you've already delivered so many words of wisdom, but I always like to have the audience, I like to have my guests leave the audience with a last words of wisdom. What would you like to leave the audience with for today? Some words of wisdom you can leave us with. 
And, and Jason, I'm going to go to a specific quote, if, that, if that's an okay approach. That is. Um, it's an Abraham Lincoln quote. And I, I'm going to give the gist of it as opposed to the entire quote. It's quite lengthy, but he basically says that, you know, I do the best I can every day and I mean to keep doing so till the end. And if the end brings me out right, so be it. If it brings me out wrong, angels swearing I was right wouldn't make a difference. Mm. I think that's how we need to live. You do the best you can. You give yourself permission not to do it perfect today and to do it better tomorrow. And you don't worry about what others are saying. You don't let people pull the, you know, you don't let people dig the thing up to look at the roots to see if the seed is germinating. You just keep pushing. You test, you tweak, you enhance, you adjust, you keep doing it over and over and over and over again. And if we could teach ourselves to do that and work incrementally, and if you need a simple example of how that works, just pick up your cell phone. How many apps on your cell phone have updated this week? That's what, what, we, that's what we do in the app land, right? It's what we have to do in our life. I'm going to do it a little better today than I did yesterday. And if I don't do it as well today as I did yesterday, that's fine. What did I learn that will allow me to do it a little better tomorrow? If we would just take that approach and stick to what we believe in and do what we know and stop trying to please everybody else, we're going to open the door to take that journey we've traveled, release those lessons, and serve the people we're here to serve. And we'll find out who they are by knowing they're the ones that cross our paths in need and reveal it to us in some way that we can relate to. Yeah, that's beautiful, Michael. Well, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of myself and behalf of the amazing audience that's going to be listening to this today. Really amazing uh, value you gave us, some uh, information. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for making me a little bit emotional. The, the story about the, the two inmates was, uh, that was something. So uh, yeah, I just want to thank you again for being on the podcast today and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. My privilege, man. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Michael.